Okay, one of the commandments in this week's Torah portion, Kedoshim, it's a double portion we read this year. Sometimes they read them separately, Achrei Mot Kedoshim, but this year we read them together. It depends on how the, the, the dates come out with the year. <clears throat> in any case, there's a lot of commandments in this Kedoshim. There's 51 of them. And one of them is Orla. Orla is, if you live in Israel, the first three years that you plant a fruit tree, if there grows any fruits within those first three years, it's forbidden to eat them. And not only is it forbidden to eat them, but sometimes if it gets mixed up in other fruits, it's forbidden to eat all of them. If you can't recognize the one, and that's forbidden. So let's say you have a whole, um, a huge uh, orchard, vineyard, whatever, and uh, you plant one, all the trees are there for you know, 50 years, you inherit it from someone. And then you plant one tree, one grapevine or one whatever, and it grows up, they grow fast. And it grows up after, say two years before, within the three years, after two and a half years, you wanna go out and start plucking fruits. <clears throat> someone says, what are you doing? You know, my vineyard, you want some grapes? He says, no, no, no. I saw you plant uh, grapes there uh, two and a half years ago. He says, so what? So what? See, all those grapes are forbidden. All forbidden. <clears throat> and you can say, well, listen, I know very nice. I see, you know, you want to be a religious Jew, but I see you don't know your laws. The law is, is that <clears throat> those fruits within the first three years, they're called orla. And that if they get mixed up into 200 other fruits that aren't Orla, and you can't recognize the forbidden fruit, so they're all permissible. So it's okay for me to, this is no, you're wrong. If it gets plucked and it gets mixed up, then you're right. But if it's still grown, joined to the ground, and you can't recognize, you don't know which tree it is that you planted. If you can recognize it, then there's no problem. You can pick all the others. <clears throat> but if you don't recognize which tree it is, and there's 5,000 trees and they all have fruits and you don't know which one or even which area your tree is, can't be sure, then you can't eat any of them. That's the law. If it's joined to the ground, it's forbidden. It's, it's a, a Mishnah. And, Mishnah is Orla. So here we go. In the Parshish Kadoshim, this week's Torah portion called Kadoshi, Reditzich is talking about Vegendem Iser, the prohibition of Orla. Nitsu is not to eat the fruits. Let's see, maybe make this a little bigger here. There we go. Not to eat the fruits from a tree which are in the first three years. Zuck the Mishnah, Mishnah says, Natiya shall orla, a or a, 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 a tree of orla. In other words, a tree that's was planted within three years. Shinis arva benatios that gets mixed up in a bunch of others. Harize loyal code. If you're not allowed to pick, you're not allowed to pick. You have one tree which is within three years, and it gets mixed up in the five hundred. 100 trees in one <clears throat> field, one of, and you don't know, you can't recognize the one you planted. You don't remember which one it is. You don't remember which side it is. There's no sign where you can recognize. So it says you're not allowed to pick any of those trees. But if you do happen to pick it by accident, then uh, if there's 200 kosher fruits, then you can eat them all. But if there's not 200, then you can't, they're all forbidden. <clears throat> They're done by Orla. The law about Orla is as when as missions if it gets mixed up fruits of Orla with fruit with fruits that are permissible, as Varen's a bottle, then they are all permissible. It's a bottle that's the, the Isser is negated, the forbidden one is negated. Then is the Peros Heter <clears throat> in Esfran Sve Hundred Mol. If there's 200 times permissible fruits against one forbidden fruit, and you can't recognize where that forbidden fruit is, so then they're okay. 
and then you can eat them all. <clears throat> and the mystery is surim, and then all the other is surim in the Torah is sometimes it's, it's uh, negated in rov, majority, or 60. And orally, you have to have 200. If you learn, you, you want to be a rabbi, so there's laws which are called ta'aruvot, mixtures. And you learn about these different mixtures and when things can be forbidden and when they're permissible. Also, it's a very interesting laws. And one of the laws, though, is this law of orla. If you have one fruit that was plucked from a tree from from within three years, so that fruit is forbidden. If that fruit gets mixed up in 200 other fruits, and you can't tell which one is which, you can't tell which is forbidden, then all those fruits are permissible. But if it gets mixed up in 199 other fruits, as all those fruits are forbidden. Of course, <clears throat> it has to be that you don't recognize, you don't know which one is the forbidden one. All of them are forbidden. So that's when when the fruits are plucked. But if they're, gathered, if they're stuck in the ground, if you haven't didn't pluck them yet, then if you have one tree that has orla, that has fruits on it, and that tree was planted less than three years ago, or three years ago or less, then you can't eat any of the fruits on that tree, of course. And if you don't recognize which tree that is, you don't know where it is, then all the fruits in the whole entire field and the whole entire orchard are forbidden. The law is, if it gets mixed up in 200 and they're all not connected to the ground, so if it's 200 or more, then it's okay. You can eat all of them, right? If you don't recognize the forbidden one. But this is only what we call bidi of it. If it happened, if by accident it got mixed up into 200. If it's already mixed up. But lechadchila, you can't do it. What does it mean? You can't, let's say you have a tree and it has apples on it. And you picked all the apples, and someone says, what are you doing? You say, oh, I'm picking the apples. They're the nice ones. Huh? He says, listen, that tree you just picked from, I know that tree. That tree you planted less than three years ago. He says, yeah, so what? He says, that means that all of the fruits are forbidden. All the fruits are forbidden. He says, wow, it's, it's, it's pretty severe, you know. No, that's what it is. Boy, you wait one year, and then you can eat all the fruits. He says, you sure? Yeah, eat all the fruits. He says, good. So he goes into the other room, and some comes along with somebody else doesn't know this law and he sees one basket over here of, of these fruits and there's let's say 500 other baskets so he just mixes them all together they come you come back to throw these fruits away because you're not supposed to get any pleasure from them can't give it to your animal to eat or whatever so you all of a sudden where's the basket oh i mixed them all together if you mix them all together then if there's 200 times as much permissible as forbidden then the whole business is permissible he says but that's only if it got mixed up by accident, but you can't mix them up on purpose and say, well, if it's permissible in 200, so I'll just put 200. You know, that's all there is to it. And I take a short break over here, one second. Just one minute. So the law is that you're not allowed to take something that's forbidden and mix it up in a way that it becomes what we call negated. What does it mean negated? Here, let me give you an example. If a drop of milk <clears throat> falls into a pot of meat, <clears throat> and there's, let's say, 50 times as much meat as milk, 50 times. So the whole business is forbidden. What if there is 60 times? Then it's all permissible. As long as the, you can't see the milk anymore, it's all permissible because that's what's called bitl bashishi. As soon as there's 60 times against, 60 times of something that's permissible against what's forbidden, and the thing that's forbidden, you can't see anymore. There's only just basically the taste left. So the taste is negated. We see the taste is gone in 60. There are some things where you have 60 is not enough. You have to have 100, like truma. Some things you have to have 200. But all these are talking about if it happened, but you can't do it on purpose. You can't take a piece of butter and throw it into uh, 60 times as much meat. You're not allowed to do that. If it happened, that's what's called bidi of it. After the act, if it happened, then it's permissible. So you're not allowed to negate something forbidden intensely. That's called levatal isra lechatchila. You're not allowed to do that. Okay.
You're not allowed to take something that's forbidden and do some sort of a process by which the <coughs> iser goes away. As far as mixtures go concerned. Sometimes it's permissible. For instance, an animal, when it's alive, you can't eat it. If you just kill an animal, you also can't eat it. It has to be slaughtered properly. So there's a case where you can take something that's forbidden and you can make it permissible, but not by means of a mixture. Okay. So the Mishnah says like this. If, well, let me just continue this. Don't. If there is one part, orla, orla we said are fruits within three years, and they get mixed up in 200 of, of the same type of fruits, 200, then the whole thing is permissible. 200, it's all permissible. <clears throat> but like we said, that's if it happened accidentally, could it happen? But this is only on the condition that it's not attached to the ground. If it's attached to the ground, then one orla tree, you know, there's a tree which is within the first three years, makes all of the trees in the whole entire orchard, even if there's a million trees, they're all forbidden. All the trees are, unless you can recognize that orla tree, as soon as you recognize it, then you can pick from all the rest. Because it's not really a true mixture. But now, if you can't recognize it, then it's all mixed together. If it's joined to the ground, it can never be negated. Oh, well, that's what the Rui wants. Okay, what's the look? The, their Tom, the reason why fruits from Orla are negated only after you pick them, but all the time that these fruits are attached to the tree and the tree is attached to the ground, but you can cut the tree down. <clears throat> so therefore, the, they will never be, you can never negate it, even if there's a million, because a thing which is attached to the ground can't be negated. Here we go. It says, Mahubar lo batel, a thing which is joined to the ground can never lose its identity. It makes everything forbidden. Everything. The whole all in your name from me. I mean, so this is you know it's pretty severe. Let's say, for instance, there's a person that you don't like, and he has a big uh, you know, a big field of apples, a million apple trees. So you plant one <clears throat> apple tree there and you don't tell him about it. And within three years, it looks like all the other trees. Then all the trees are forbidden. You go and tell them, you know what? You go and tell the person, I planted a tree there and it's forbidden. Well, the whole business, now the whole thing is forbidden. All the trees are forbidden because it's joined to the ground. Alayyanin from Nigla, everything which is in the which is in legal Torah, revealed Torah, as Zion and Hora, they are a teaching also for serving God in spirituality, to serve God. What could be the lesson over here? <clears throat> See, is a cloud as a general per, per, principle in the Torah, as mute that battle enrolled, that if there is one forbidden thing and it gets mixed up in two forbidden things, <clears throat> two forbidden things, then a lot of times that's good enough. If they're both dry, if everything is dry, let's say, for instance, you get one forbidden, uh, let's say, an uh, uh, egg from uh, a chicken <clears throat> that the chicken was not kosher. So let's say the egg becomes not kosher, right? Not kosher, but you can't tell it between all the others. So if you're sure that one egg, or let's say a piece of meat, here's a better example. You have a piece of meat, and it's a small piece. It can't be a big piece. It gets a little bit different law. You have one small piece of meat, and it came from a cow, and you slaughtered the cow improperly, and now that piece of meat is forbidden. And that piece of meat is a small piece of meat. It gets mixed up in two pieces, two pieces. You can't tell which one is which. It says that it's permissible. The whole thing is permissible. Huh? It's all 100% weird law, weird law. Because if you cook them together also, it won't give a taste. You can't tell which the, what's the taste of this. But all the time that they are <clears throat> dry and they're not cooked, so it's negated in majority. Majority, two against one. <clears throat> Can that's what battle broke. Can Tucker could be as a Jew might think, Vibald as Atemam Atikola Amin. 
what do we say? The majority rules. If there's just two pieces of permissible and one piece of a forbidden, then the whole thing becomes permissible. So you see that a thing loses its identity <clears throat> in the majority. So the Jews can think, well, we are the minority and the majority are non-Jews. <clears throat> and that's the way God created us. So we lose our identity. Eden Zion and Minderhert, the Jews are a, <clears throat> a minority, sufficient all the Felker among all the other nations of the world. V is Meglech. How can it be possible that Jews should have the power, Nitzuvern Oiskimisht, not to be lose their identity and mixed up, confused in Nitvern Butel, and to lose their whole, I say, their their singularity to the Umas Olam, to all the people, everything. If the majority is, is let's say, we have one piece of forbidden and two pieces of permissible, so the majority rules. Same thing with the Jews. We have one Jew and there's two non-Jews, and here we have 500 non-Jews, how much the Jews are in the world of 1,000 rows to one. So if so, we should be negated. Zwischen Velcher is gefin in sich schoin, ois will hundrete, and we've been mixed up among these non-Jews, we've been mixed up for hundreds of years. How can we retain our identity? Right. Them is the horror, and this is the teaching, what we learn over here from Orla. If it gets mixed up in a bunch of other trees, if it's joined to the ground, then it never loses its identity. Vibalt, because as Yidin, Umatom, wherever the Jews are, they are joined with their makor, with the source. A Jew, even if he doesn't know that he's a Jew, but the fact that in fact he is a Jew, this connects him with his source, mit neighbor, which is God. As Ken and Zainit Veren Oiskimish, therefore they can never lose their identity. Zayzain and Alamo, they are always on Badad Yishkon, they are always a nation which is alone, singularly, and in the non Jews, they're not reckoned. A folk for Zich, they're an, a nation in themselves. Punkt Kibiyachal, just like the Abishter, just like God, is Ani Hashem, I am God, and I never change, is in, 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 in God, is Nitmul Kain Shum Andrung, Nita, God can never change, God does not become not God or something. Er is Havaya, God is past, present, and future, he creates all being, all time. Nothing changes him. There's nothing except for him. Azoi also, Zainan Oich Yidin, also the Jewish people, Durach Vatam Advekim, by Jews clinging to God, and every Jew automatically, whether he knows it or not, is clinging to God. Vir, it's a Zain, Zer Chibra, they're linked, their connection with God is Abed Gans, it's always constant. Vidar Pasuk, like the sentence says, Vatam Bene Yisrael, Lo Chalisim. Because I am God and I never change, therefore, you Jewish people, I guarantee you, you are never going to chalisam be destroyed. As in Zay is nit shine kain kalyon, there is no opposition whatsoever. And this is pretty bizarre if you think about it. And it is, you know, it, let's say if the Jewish people just keep a sort of a low profile and they would keep to themselves, then you know, okay, you can understand that the, you know the, they wouldn't be dissolved among the non-Jews, but and, but they don't. We see the Jew always sticks out. All the sticks out. I think I told I told everybody. I think I told everyone that I saw once an interview with Trotsky. Trotsky was a a, a, a big uh, macher in the Russian Revolution. He was like the head of the Russian army, the Red Army, and he and and he was a Jew. I think his name was Bornstein or something. The reason I remember is because I have a next door neighbor called Bornstein. And so his, he was a Jew, but he was totally non, I mean, he was a murderer. The fact is he was a murderer, mass murderer in order to, to, to hold this place. And he was clever and he was cunning and he was intelligent and he knew like 15 different languages. And he had this idea of, you know, international communism was going to take over the whole world and it was going to be this. And, you know, it was religion was just the last thing on his, you know, list of identities. So they asked him, you know, are you, um, are you Jewish? And he said, I'm an atheist and I'm a communist. And, but I guess you have to say, he said, I guess you have to say that I'm a Jewish communist, atheist, you know, Jewish. 
I don't remember exactly his language, but I know he did not in any way deny his Judaism, and he asserted his Judaism, but he just, you know, qualified the statement. Don't think that means that I believe in God or anything like that. I don't believe how much you what? What's he a Jew? What's the big deal? He's a Jew. And in the end, it ended up that Stalin made that made that a point. You know, you can't trust these guys, the Jews. You know, they're bloodsuckers and everything. Like that you got to kill Stalin and, and Trotsky. And in the end, he did. He did. He, he ended up killing him. The point is, is that. The Trotsky, even though as far away as he was from Judaism, he was really far away. I mean, as far as he could possibly get on his own, but he did not deny his Judaism. Did not deny. So we see that every Jew somehow or other is connected to this Jewish identity as the Pusif. That's what it means. I am God. I never changed. And you, the Jewish people, um, you, the Jewish people, therefore, I guarantee you, you will never stop. Atem lokalisam. You will never end. Kalisim be destroyed. Says the Rebbe, there's another explanation on the sentence. Ani Hashem lo shenisi v'atem b'nei Yisrael lo kalisim. You ever see? It says that. Atem b'nei Yisrael. Ani Hashem lo shenisi. Where is that possible? Where is that possible? I am God. Okay, I am God. I never change. It's from a prophet. I can't re remember where it was. Okay, Ani Hashem Lo Shiniti. Anyway, I am God. I never. Oh, here it is. Ani Hashem Lo Shiniti. I am God. I never changed. I never changed. That's the beginning of the sentence. And at the end, it's a sentence from Malachi, the prophet Malachi. I am God. I never change. And you, Jewish people, you will never be expired. Want to call it? You'll never stop. So that's. In other words, I guarantee you. There's always going to be a Jewish people. That's one explanation. Here we have another explanation. And it goes like this. As their pasuk, it says, I am God, I never change. But Atam and Israel and you, B'nai Yaakov, you Jewish people, lo kalitam, this is a, a wonder. God is, is, is expressing his surprise. What's the surprise? I am God and I never change. I am eternal. As if so, is for us. Why Atem ben Israel localism? Why Jewish people are you not expiring? Why don't you have, how do you say, tremendous longing for me? You should be your soul should be going out just to be attached to me. I'm so good and I love you so much. Why don't you reciprocate with the same type of love? Atem ben Israel localism. And you Jewish people, you're not expiring, you're not going longing for me. For us, Paul near the idea, why doesn't it cause any change in you when you know the fact that I am God, you're God, and I never change, and I created the whole world, and I'm infinite, and I'm your special God? That should make you excited, but you're not. Atem, B'nai Yaakov, Lokalisa, and you, B'nai Yaakov, you're not excited. You're not going out of your, your, uh, your, your little limitations. Azoi Viala Purushim, just like all of the explanations from the same sentence, they are connected one to the other, is da oich marumas, here it's hinted at, as a fila dem yid, even a Jew, was gefin zich in a matzah on the yidia, as that, the knowledge from I am God, and God, and it never change, and this doesn't have any effect on him whatsoever, and it doesn't have any colors and nefesh, he doesn't go excited, he's not excited about the fact that I am, that I am God, is er oich dan Nevertheless, he's always attached to his source. When Bemelin so automatically is nit shayach, it's not relevant by him, any bitol ukloyim. Therefore, a Jew can and will never stop being a Jew. Especially the umas olam by the non Jews, if, uh, God forbid. Like the explanation of the first. So again, we, we brought this sentence from Malachi. And the sentence says, right, like all the prophets, he's reproving the Jewish people. But also, like all the prophets, there's always comfort, promises. You know, you Jewish people, you're making me mad. You're driving me crazy. I'm really disappointed in you. I'm angry at you. You have no idea I'm going to take it out on you, but I always love you. And you're never going to stop Jewish people. There's never going to be an end to the Jewish people. The Jewish people will never uh, go, go out, go away. That's one explanation. The second one is, 
I am God, I never change. Why does that not make you want to go away, go out of yourself, to be excited about me? Why? So the Rebbe says, both of them are connected. Even if a Jew, he knows about God, but he totally does not get excited about it at all. Nevertheless, the first explanation still always holds true. I am God, I never change, and you Jewish people will never end. You know, it's... <clears throat> But you have to reveal this in a revealed way. Right. And listen, it's like this. A Jew can say, hey, one second. Let's think about this. God loves me no matter what I do. So I'll do whatever I want. Why should, why should I suffer in the world? Why should I you know, have a difficult life? I'll just do whatever I want, say whatever I want, eat whatever I want, do, you know, think, do whatever I want. Because God's going to love me anyway. So what do you say to a person like that? You say, you're right, 100%. You certainly can. There's no doubt about it. But if God is so good and he loves you such an infinite love, don't you think that you're, you are missing something out by not reciprocating with that love? What are you missing out? You're missing humanness. Human, normal person. Somebody does you good, so you give them at least a little recognition, a little thanks. True, God's not going to punish you, and God will always be connected to you, and God will always love you, and all these things. That, that's true. But that doesn't in any way lessen the fact that you still have a big debt to him. You won't collect the debt, but still you got a big debt. When Darpa Baruchian says you have to reveal this in, in a revealed way, that all the nations of the world should see that the name of God is called on you. It should be something that is visible, the godliness which in Jews is nit nor it's not only which that the, the Amya Oritz, what does it say? We're all called Amya Oritz, all the people of the world. Not only the people of the world should see that you are a God's people. Was thus is kolel, this includes all the things of the world. Amya Oritz means all the as villain nit menagiza. Not only will the world not oppose you, nor honor of a Yerumimeko, they'll be afraid of you. What does it mean they'll be afraid? They'll be afraid not to take a lesson from you. That when they villain a royce help and they will help the Jews be Avodasam is serving God and in, in the service of God. Because Das is Dach Taklis, this is the whole purpose of the creation. The whole purpose of the creation is that the Jewish people should convince the whole world that there's God and the people, the whole world should connect to the Creator. This will re re remove, this will relieve the world from all of its tensions and anxieties and, and, and negativity. And everyone will know, you know, God helps us. God loves us. God will provide for us. We have to be his partners. We have to do whatever we can. So I'll be his partner. What if we fail? Okay, I'll try again. It's not the end of the world. Vi the Mishnah, like the Mishnah says, lo nivra'el l'sham sheni. The world was only created to serve me. I mean, I'm sorry, the world, a Jewish person said, a Jew should say, the world was made in order to serve me, and I was made to serve God. Al Alts is Bishaf, and the whole world is in order to connect themselves to the Jews, and the Jewish people are there in order to connect themselves to God. The Eber de Menta Horah, this teaching, as Mechuber, Veren Nit Batal, that something which is connected will never be negated, will never be negated, state in, it says in... The Mishnah, it says in the Mishnah by Orla, right? It's in the fourth chapter of Orla, it says, was their inyan from Orla is tikkun oifen chet etzadas. It says the whole thing of Orla is fixing up with the th first three years that you're not allowed to eat fruits. It says this is a fixing for the, the sin of the tree of knowledge. It says that man was commanded not to eat from the tree of knowledge. And three, when was it, when, when would this whole business happen? So man was created on Friday. And he was created like, you know, late on Friday. There were other things, there were animals and stuff, but they were created also on Friday. And man was created on Friday. And he was, after that, he was commanded not to eat from the tree. And it says he ate from the tree three hours before Shabbat came in. And if he would have waited those three hours, it would have been permissible for him to eat from that forbidden tree. It wouldn't be forbidden. It would be, but he couldn't wait for three hours. So it's because you couldn't wait for three hours so therefore, now, how do you fix it up? 
that you should wait for three years. Don't eat from the fruits from any tree you plant in the land of Israel for three years. Okay, so that fixes up the sin of the tree of knowledge. As stated, it says in Kabbalah, and it says also in Hasidut, the teachings of Hasidut, as their hate eats that the sin of the tree of knowledge had caused as Klippa Zalverin Amanage to Kedusha. And all of a sudden there was a thing in the world which was called Klippa, and that it could oppose godliness. The world still remains godly, and everything is godly, and everybody is still good, but there's what's called a shell that covered it over. And that's what happened when man ate from the tree. Oich Faran Chet, even before the sin, let me make this bigger, I can't see this while I'm reading. Excuse me one moment. <clears throat> also, before the sin of the tree of knowledge, it was a Matthias from Clipper. There was such a thing as bad and covering over God. There was such a thing. Over, but then before Adam ate from it, from the, from the tree, this bad and selfishness was not, a, didn't oppose holiness. Adarab, exactly the opposite. Man used his own ego in order to serve God. His own selfish feeling was in order that he should be a better servant of the creator, more original, more <clears throat> unique and, and practical. Z is given via klippa. <clears throat> it was something, the bad, evil then, was something like a, a, sh a shell or a peel on a tree, which the peel protect, protects the fruit which is inside of it. Nor the hate, but by means of the sin of the tree of knowledge is given a minagid. All of a sudden, the covering of the world, the covering over good, became an opposition to good. As men that durach firan the ab oibin the mantar hara, but if we follow the previously mentioned teaching from the uh, that we said about Orla, namely the waiting for three years and also being connected. As long as you're connected, you're never negated as men that often, often <clears throat> a royce bring in them Hebrew, then we can reveal in a revealed way, bring, the, bring out in a revealed way the connection between the Jews and God. Durch dem wird netaken, by means of this, it will be fixed up that which the sin of the tree of knowledge had caused. And it was what happened when man ate from the tree of knowledge is he stopped thinking about God. Stopped thinking about God. Suddenly all of his own thoughts and his own ego and his own worries and his own apprehensions, that covered him. They started thinking about himself all the time. And that's what's called a klippa, a shell <clears throat> over godliness. <clears throat> but by means of feeling, fulfilling what we just said, the Jews will not blow, not only will they not lose their identity and be lost among the non-Jews, but even more, <clears throat> the non-Jews in the world, the Gentiles, they'll <clears throat> their hair and they will understand and feel as a constant that the whole existence is in order to join to the Jews and help the Jews in improving the world and bringing blessing to the world. VC is given like it was before the sin. In other words, Jews won't be concerned at all with any worldly things. They'll only be concerned about serving God, and the non-Jews will help them. As clear, but not that they'll help them to get into heaven, that they'll help them. What does it mean, serving God? Serving God means fixing up the world. Just like it was before the sin of the tree of knowledge, that the clip, that the, the, the shell, the, what now is opposing our egotism, in other words, was not, it, it, it protected over godliness. The undo then it'll be that all of the nations of the world will stand up and they'll happily, it says, they'll, they'll herd our sheep. And the Gulam Tashlema, then the Najus, everyone will have work and the Najus will be tremendously happy to do something that's truly productive and help the Jews serve the creator to bring blessing into the world. That, that's going to all be accomplished by means of the Mashiach. Well, the Mashiach is the Rebbe. The Rebbe is telling us what to do. But Korob Mamish, this speech was made in 1954. How to fix up the world.
All right, and we had a story already today, so we won't continue the story. God bless. Tomorrow morning, 8.15, there will be a class with a story. Shalom Ubracha.